The B-58 Hustler was to be America's next generation of bomber aircraft, but Convair saw well beyond the military applications and was very excited to propose that its little B-58 supersonic bomber would be the gateway to civil operations, essentially become the American Concorde well before those dastardly Europeans. Convair knew that this task was daunting and that they needed to slowly approach the military and ease them into the idea of civilians flying at Mark 2.0. This video was based on an excellent book by Scott Lothar and I recommend you go to his site Aerospace Projects Review to see the many more crazy aircraft designs just like this and trust me, you will spend all day looking. Let's break the sound barrier with Convair's supersonic dream. Convert would propose a three-stage plan. The first was to simulate SST operations over a random American city to see how the impact of sonic booms would affect the population. The second was to modify an existing B-58 to carry passengers in a pod underneath and the third was to build a prototype civil version of the Hustler called the B-58-9. This first stage of the program was the easiest and the quickest to approve by the military. By using a combined fleet of B-58s, F-104s, 101s and 106s, the US Air Force flew around 1,200 missions over Oklahoma City, consistently reaching supersonic speeds. They would then monitor the amount of complaints, which came in at around 3% of the population. Next, Phase 2. Convair would need to test the public to flying supersonic transport. You see, until this point, only the military had actually ridden in a supersonic aircraft and during these flights, they would be so involved in flying the plane or other operations that they wouldn't even notice the massive increase in G-forces. The average Harry and Jane, on the other hand, had barely even been up in the sky on an aeroplane and thus Convair had no real thought how to test the average passenger and see how that they would react to flying double the speed of sound. So Convair proposed a people pod, removing the fuel pod and the nuke from the B-58 and replacing it with a pressurized container that could carry up to five passengers. These passengers would be encouraged to read books, listen to their favorite music, and even take naps just to see how comfortable it would be to fly at those speeds. The passengers would be in a single row of five seats with air conditioning and the small windows with the rear of the pod containing the testing equipment. All of this replaced the fuel pod, so the B-58 could only fly for around 30 minutes of supersonic speeds, but that was perfect enough for a test and the perfect time for a nap. But it's the third stage of Convair's plan that really kicks it up a notch. The third phase of Convair's SST plan was to construct up to 12 supersonic transports. Dubbed the Convair Model 62 or the B-58-9, it would use the B-58 Hustler as its base but would be built differently for more efficient supersonic travel. It would have the same four engines but they would be positioned differently with the outboard ones moved from below the wing to the actual wingtips talk about wingtip vortices. Its long slim fuselage would easily hold 52 passengers in a 1-1 configuration and have a crew in side-by-side -side positions. Although Convair also suggested that they could slightly expand the cabin to either have 1-2 seating or even 2x2 seating, easily doubling the capacity. And it's this little bit of trivia that absolutely makes me laugh how Convair was thinking about the money. The seat specifically would be from the, air quotes, highly successful Convair 880600. This jet would also be able to cruise at Mach 2.4 for 2,525 nautical miles. It's a little bit shy of New York to London, but the jet could easily land in Ireland or Greenland to refuel and then keep going, still easily arriving hours before a typical commercial aircraft. The first of these four jets would start fly testing by 1963 with Convair, with the other models being handed out to the FAA, NASA and the US Air Force for operational shakedowns. 
In this 18 month test period, they would fly around the world in and out of airports at various altitudes, temperatures and humidities to test not only how well the aircraft performed, but also to see what other issues occurred at airports and what economical factors need to be considered for actual commercial operations. Plus, it would give all the locals in these whimsical localities real life experience with dealing with supersonic transports before later expected arrival of commercial fleets in the 1970s. But these locals never even saw the arrival of a single Convair SST. What happened? Well, it turns out that Washington saw one major flaw. Now, the Convair 58-9 was a cool looking aircraft and it looked like it could do the numbers, but for the US military, funding it didn't make any sense. While phase one was carried out with multiple aircraft flying over Oklahoma City, around 3% of the population did actually hear the supersonic booms and complain to the government. This was sufficient for the government to be turned off SST travel thanks to these booms. But that wasn't the final blow. It actually came from initial work done by competitors Boeing and Lockheed. At this point, the ambition of supersonic travel heated up and the government was being tempted by newer and flashier designs like the Boeing 2707 or its Lockheed counterpart, the L2000, that could carry more passengers and go even further. Why would they bother developing a derivative of a bomber, which by the way, was costing an incredible amount of money at the time, something that you can hear all about in our B-58 video that's still on the channel. But I'm getting ahead of myself and we'll get to the competition with Boeing and Lockheed in a moment. As for the Convair 58-9, it died on the drawing board, a dream of supersonic flight that was almost within reach. But Convair wasn't done yet and they had one more trick up their sleeve. Not to be disappointed with the news of their beloved 58-9, they realized that they could come up with a special supersonic transport version that would use some of the new technology being developed for the upcoming SR-71 program. The hybrid would be shorter in length, but thicker with two Cs. It would also see the return of the pod like on the B-58. God, Convair really loves their pods, don't they? This new version would be called the RC-80 and would be used as a recon plane or a carrier of high-value cargo, limited number of special passengers or diplomats. This recon variant would be packed full of cameras and sensors and would be used for a special role. It wouldn't fly as fast as the SR-71 or as high as the U-2, but rather be used as a border patrol aircraft. It would fly along an area of interest and look sideways, using a vast array of windows to peer safely into enemy territory. And while that may sound a bit like a flaw, its design did have several advantages over the SR-71. For one, it could fly a lot longer at Mach 2.4 than the high-speed Blackbird, thanks to its vast fuel tanks. It would also have many more crew members who could work in comfort for longer times, or even work in shifts thanks to in-flight refueling. There was also a cargo version that was a little bit longer, and its use case mirrored the SST designs for mass quick transport of around 30 individuals and cargo, something that was very useful for US military operations. With feedback from the US government, Convair would take this initial design and turn it into the QRC-182. This version embraced its spy role much further and had more room for more sensors, but at the cost of passenger operations. It would have a side cargo door, the famous B-58 pod with fuel and sensors, and plenty of room for working crew on board. It could also fly for longer as well. There was also a rear aft equipment bay by its tail. It would have been connected by a small bridge past the fuel tanks in the middle and allowed this little area to be used for crew or resting. Because of the choice to have a mid-fuselage fuel tanks, the concept no longer really suited transportation of passengers, but you bet with some rework it might have been a real little treat. Although some designs have this area listed as baggage, it could still carry around 30 passengers on board. Now, whilst this is all going on, the US government also started the American Concord program and Convair wasn't going to be caught empty handed like they were before. They said if Boeing and Lockheed were going to be designing actual aircraft, then they should get a chance too. And this is what they came up with. <laughs> 
Convair was feeling pretty confident by the early 1960s. They had so far designed multiple SST passenger planes with the B-58-9, the RC-80 and the QRC-182. What if they could break from tradition and then actually design a passenger SST from the ground up instead of basing it on a bomber? In May 1960, Convair revealed their SST, simply called the Convair Mach 3 SST. As the name would have it, it would also fly at Mach 3 thanks to six non-afterburning turbojets, just like the XB-70, which ironically was also proposed to be refitted into a passenger plane, and it's a video that we have right now on the channel. Gosh, aren't you lucky if you're a first-time viewer? So, this Convair SST could carry 135 passengers in a 3-2 configuration to a range of around 4,000 nautical miles, with a prototype expected to fly by 1967 and service to begin in 1970 with 145 aircraft at a cool $14.1 million each, just in time for the new supersonic decade. Wow. Talk about ambitious. Alas, Convert wasn't as successful as Lockheed or Boeing in the program. Whilst I've gone into massive detail before on this program on the channel, it was due to the other designs just being more cool. The Boeing concept was dreamed at such an over-the-top aircraft with folding wings that it won the initial support from the government and beat Convair. And that's really it. It was quite the rapid end to the Convair passenger dreams on that cold winter of 1963, but the combined opposition to supersonic booms and the lack of government funding not only ended Convair's aspirations, but supersonic died as well. Actually, future Nick here, Convair did propose to build a hypersonic project that would have been a lot longer and a lot more uh, bigger, but it's definitely something that we can do in another video. And I, for one, am quite upset, to be honest. I feel like that Convair was really close to some of these designs and had the B-58 program not massively exceeded costs, it would have potentially developed a civil version. And speaking to Scott Lawther of Aerospace Projects Review, who helped with the research of this video today, he had this to say. The military variants would be operational, but the civilian versions would be just to check out the technology and the operations. The US Air Force might have been able to absorb the expense of a passenger cargo transport version of the B-58, but not a chance in hell that a commercial airline would have been built. Only those with no burning desire for profit motive married with deep pockets would have flown such a vehicle. Pure NASA versions of the B-58-9 also make sense painted white and fastened with sensors, test panels of new materials or manufacturing techniques, experimental engines on one or two pylons, perhaps even a small launch vehicles or air-breathing parasite test vehicles under the center line. Perhaps some exorbitantly rich types might have had their own B-58-9 after it had served its testing purpose. Howard Hughes, the Shah and oil sheiks. This is a world that was never born, and I honestly feel a little bit sad at the end of these videos when I have to deliver this very obviously bad news. Let me know in the comments what you think and what you want to see on the next Found and Explained video.